Okay, welcome to the next video in our workshop, interpreting Exodus 19, four to six. This is the third video in our in our series on the, the interpretation and understanding of the full significance of Exodus 19, four to six. We are using this predominantly at this point in time in our covenants class, but this could be applied in multiple classes as a building block and a, a workshop for, for a class on kingdom, for a class on the law, the different views of the law on a class on the theology of Exodus. So we're not gonna be able to say everything there is in this exposition, but we will, we will, we will highlight the significances and then we'll just add videos later depending upon the nuance or depending upon the, the tag of the class. So what we'll do in this video is we're gonna go line by line, phrase by phrase, word by word, just unpacking the meaning. And that will be the extent of this exposition of Exodus 19, four to six. After this video, we'll, we'll do a video on the New Testament fulfillment, also looking back at the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant. And so that'll be that'll be another video. And then also we'll have either in, in that video or maybe a separate video, just, just really bringing together the exegetical outline and big idea and preparing the foundation for, for you to, to prepare your own homiletical uh, outline for preaching or teaching a lesson plan. And um, one other thing I'll just add is that we are looking at the broader context in Exodus because that is very pertinent to, to this text as well. So we will, we will be looking at the broader context of Exodus, and that's part of this exposition because it's contained, there is significance is contained here. This is a very fundamental passage for Exodus and especially the Old Covenant. So let's go ahead, let's get into it. We're just going to go and just, just start working through here. And we're not going to repeat everything that we said in the structural analysis. I'll refer you to that video as well. So looking at the first line here, we highlighted the major parts. So I'm just, I'm not going to write everything out. I'll just highlight what we identified in the last video. The actor, the verb, the object. And we talked about how this object is really dealing with the entire, these three phrases here. Okay, so we have the, and so we, we highlighted from the structural analysis, we identified that the actor here in, in this object is the Lord. And, and we made some significance as we call this fundamentally the works of God. Let's further identify why we would say this. Okay, so maybe you're asking why we would, we would call this the works of God. So I, I is the Lord. This is the one doing the action. The act, the, the act is did. And so really unpacking this word here, this word for did. If I look at this word here, the, the form is asiti, or it's coming from asa, asa. And so asa is actually a very important word here. So let's highlight what this is and the meaning of this. So the word is, I'll just write the English so you can you can see that asa. And this this means to do or make. To do or make. Okay. And then we can search this in, we can do a word search of this. And we'll just do the English form. And so what we notice here is that actually this word is used in Genesis chapter one in creation. And so it's used in Genesis one, seven, God made the expanse. So, so God did this, God made the expanse. Coming down here, God made two great lights. Verse 25, God made beasts of the earth. Each time this is the Asa word. God said, let us make man in our image. Verse 31, the, the creation event can be summarized as God saw everything that he had made. Again, this word asa, he had made, it was very good. God on the seventh day finished of his work that he had done. So the work there is melakha, but so that's a different Hebrew word. But then the description of that in the act, in the active, in the action is asa, what he had done. And then again, what he had done. So there's really this accent. And then, and then a third time, I mean, this is just pregnant. It's full of meaning. So what we can really highlight here is that 
God's creative act is described appropriately as work. And actually, what's really interesting is that in the, in the in the Westminster Confession, the description in general revelation, the description of God's of God's creation is literally the works of creation. So, so coming here, this is describing work. Or we could say doing. And so really what this is highlighting then is the is the works of God. We typically in evangelical circles probably only see the works of God as being creation, right? And so let's just really further unpack this. So we have in Genesis 1 to 2 to 3. There is a heavily accent. How do we describe God's creative acts? This is, we could say, his works. Or we could say the works of creation. We see that. We, we identify that. That's something big, okay? Now, uh, coming over here, we identified when it pertains to the Egyptians. That works of creation is not debated. But when we come over here and we look at what, what God did to the Egyptians, right? We talked about how this is really the, we talk about this being the, the works of judgment, his works of judgment. Okay. And so we we don't really think about God doing works of judgment, or it's not at least accented, especially in our culture of love and tolerance and acceptance, and that God accepts us for, for, for who we are. Evangelicals will accept his works of creation, but they won't really see other works that God does. And so here now we have, we have a, a different work of God, and just as important, the works of judgment. So let's ask the question, what specifically are these works of judgment? So thinking thinking from the broader context of Exodus, number one, we can really highlight. So what do those works include? Number one, the, the plagues over Egypt begin in Exodus 6 and end in Exodus 12. So we have the plagues over Egypt and this is Exodus 6 to 12. These are the, the, the works of, of, of judgment. And then also we have the, the destruction in the Red Sea. So let's do this here. So the destruction of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea is also the works of God. And this is Exodus chapter 14. We have the description, of course, used here. But then also let's just do let's just go back and do that word search again to see if the that, that also comes up. So we can go back to Exodus 19, 19.6, 19.4, I should say, 19.4. And so if we search this word, search in. So coming down here, we can scroll down to there's a lot of using of this word asa. Very common word. Yes, yeah, so we have, let's just blow this up here. So so this is this is incredible. So actually, the Moses and Aaron, the Lord is commanding, and Moses and Aaron are actually the means by which the Lord commands, but the things that they do are the very works of God. So Moses did so just as was commanded by the Lord. Seven, Moses and Aaron went and did just as the Lord commanded. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded with the Nile being turned to, to blood. The, the Lord did according to the word of Moses this time. So then the Lord does. The frogs are um, the frogs are then removed. The Lord brings an end of the of the plague. The Lord did so. Again, here, this is the, 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 the swarms of, of flies. The Lord did as Moses asked. So he's not, he's not only bringing the plagues, he's also removing the plagues. 
Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. So obviously M Moses and Aaron are the means, but this, this, this action here, all these wonders, this is the, the wonders of, of God. Uh, so it's very clear and, and strong here. So come down here and see about Exodus 14. 15, Exodus 15. Yeah, so there it is. So let's so so we're going to transition to 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 Exodus uh, 15 in, in, in a moment here. So let's let's go ahead and X this out. So we, we can we can clearly see from from the negative works of judgment, the plagues of Egypt, the plagues over Egypt and the destruction of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea are the specific works of God. And these works are in fact, works of judgment. And then we have more acts of God. We have here, he is um, bearing, the Lord bears, he carries Israel on eagle's wings. And the Lord, the Lord brought Israel to himself. Okay, so there's three there's three actions here, like we said in the structure analysis. One, two, three. But what we also want to see is not only are there works of judgment, but there's also there's also acts. So this is negative when it when it pertains to when it when it is pertaining to Egypt. But when it's pertaining to Israel, these can rightly be called the works of salvation or redemption. Okay, so so from from Israel's perspective, these are works of redemption. Okay. And so then we have three, as it pertains to Israel, three acts, one, two, and three. Let's do this. So then let's look at a parallel passage. So let's look at a parallel passage now. And this, I would say, if you're preaching on Exodus 19, I would definitely reference. So let's think about Exodus 15 and the, the Song of Moses. Let's look at Exodus 15 in the Song of Moses. So what I'm going to do here is, so let's, let's bring up Exodus 15 here. Then Moses and the people sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So let's take a pause here, okay? So clearly what's going on here is this is the judgment of God on Egypt, but it's the salvation of God for, for Israel. So we have working in tandem here, judgment and salvation. Let's go back to the text now. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The man is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh and ch Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out fury, you send out your fury, and it consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them. I draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the seas covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods? 
who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing, doing, there's the word, ose. Now this, that's a, that's a participle, which, which describes doing wonders. It's, it's not past, it's not present, it's future. It's fundamental to the character of God. He is the one who does wonders, glorious deeds. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. So let's take a pause here. So really what we see that's going on here is we're looking at two aspects. The works of God's judgment to Egypt is Israel's salvation. So we can say here in Exodus 15, 1, 1 to 12. This is God's salvation. Or we could talk about him freeing Israel. Right? But the salvation of God does not end simply in the freeing from slavery. Okay? And so in this act, we have both judgment and salvation. Okay? Coming back here now to the text. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. So redeemed is a synonym for saved. So you could have, you could just as well, you could just as well have, you have led in your steadfast love people whom you have saved, the salvation of the Lord, the redemption of the Lord. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. So looking, looking at the context here of what Israel has seen, not only has they seen, not only have they seen the salvation of the Lord, they've also seen the leading of the Lord. So not only do we see the salvation, we also see the Number two, in Exodus 15, 13 to 13 to 16, we see the leading, guiding, protecting, and providing for God's people. So let's finish this. The peoples have heard and they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are as still as stone. Till your people pass by, O Lord. Till, your, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. Again, another reference to redemption or salvation you will bring them you will bring them and plant them on your mountain the place o lord which you have made your abode the sanctuary o lord which your hands have established the lord will reign forever and ever so this is an this is incredible passage here a cre- incredible song so not only do we have the leading guiding protecting and providing of god's people we have the Number three in Exodus 15, 17 to 19. I'm sorry, 17 to 18. We have the the bringing of God's people into his presence. So what's the big takeaway here? The big takeaway is that you have verse 15 is a very, the song of Moses is a song of a summary of God's salvation of Egypt, of Israel over Egypt. Okay. And then even more succinctly, you have an even further summary in Exodus 19.5. And this forms the foundation for the call to be a part of the covenant. Okay, so this, if we can add a big idea here, this is the foundation. So let me just write this down here, big words. This is the foundation. 
the foundation. And this is the, the works of the Lord. And specifically, we have those two works, which are judgment and salvation. Judgment and salvation. So let's take a moment again and let's 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 talk about for a moment with this. Let's talk for a moment about theology. Okay. So then from a theological perspective, when we talk about the works of God, we should be able to include in the works of God. It's more than just creation, which we often think about. So let's write some of these out here. Works of God include, for sure, creation. We find out that God is not only creating, he's sustaining and giving life. So we can talk about the works of God's providence. God is also working and acting and revealing himself to man. And so we can think of revelation. He's revealing himself through, through covenants, through visions, through dreams through his angel so there's acts of god in revelation and then there's acts of god of course in redemption and this redemption is really twofold judgment and redemption judgment and salvation because these two are connected by means of of, of covenant so there's a lot more we can talk about. The big theological idea that I want us to be thinking about, though, is that when we talk about the works of God, the works of God are much more than simple redemption. They're much more than even creation. They're also negative works, his judging of people, of peoples, of nations, of angelic beings. Okay, so we want to have a very robust and full understanding of the works of God. So coming back here now, let's look at let's look at this imagery here. So let's look at this imagery here. What does this symbolize? So let's think about what an, uh, an eagle symbolizes. Okay. So an eagle is a. So just just write some ideas down here. And probably back in the day, there was probably even bigger eagles than we have now. There's there's a lot of um, there's a strong case to be made. I know in the Philippines, they have the Philippine eagle. It's phenomenal, huge bird. I want to say the wing wingspan is two meters, which is over seven feet, just ginormous, huge, huge incredible bird. Uh, eagles are, number one, they are apex predators. So they don't, they're not hunted, they hunt. Okay, and so when we think then about them caring for their young, there are multiple aspects going on here. I could be mistaken, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that when a young eagle learns to fly, they'll be kicked out of the nest and the, the, they'll fall, they'll try to flutter and flap, and the, the mother eagle will swoop underneath them and bear them up. And so there is this incredible um, protecting and caring of the young. Number three, they they provide provision for the young. That's part of this imagery. Number four, they are incredibly swift. And so here we really see in this, this imagery here of the bearing. And so coming over here, we can, this word, asa, uh, asa, this word could also be translated carried. The idea, uh, the idea of God carrying Israel on eagle's wings and then bringing him to himself. So this is this imagery has incredible pictures of of assur of assurance, comfort, and love. Okay. The next thing we see here as we're unpacking the significance of of these ideas and of images is that of this brought you to myself okay and so 
looking here, the, the let's zoom in here. The goal, the goal of redemption is relationship. Relationship with the Lord and presence with the Lord. Relationship and presence. Okay. And so this here is, of course, Israel. And this is the Lord. And we'll look at in a bit this, the full significance of 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 the lord and and who he is in relationship to to this passage and so the goal here is that the goal of of god's salvation is egypt is israel being the goal is israel being uh worshiping and serving the lord and so we actually see this throughout the 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 call to leave egypt was so that let my people go so that they may serve and worship me so the goal here is if we can just briefly further unpack this, we would want to say that this is the goal is worship and service then of the Lord. So looking here now, let's look at the big, let's look at the big picture here. So, so here we have three actions and three actors. So here we can say that in this passage here, the theology, God is the Savior, God is the actor and Savior, man is completely passive, man's action is to see what has happened, God is the one who is the actor, he is the one that's actively saving and guiding such that even though e- even though Israel travels in the wilderness they're actually physically walking th- that is that that leading and walking and is not even to be attributed to them and their work it's to be in- attributed to God i mean this is this is accenting heavily the the sovereignty of God that God is the one in control God is the one that's saving God is the one that's leading. Man is is just a passive, Israel is just a passive recipient of God's grace. Okay, so coming back to the to the full picture we have here. So we have the the object of what we of what Israel is to see are the acts or the works of God. And so this here is describing. So this here is this, this is essentially eyewitness testimony. We we talked about this in the structural analysis. They're functioning as eyewitnesses. They're they're watching what the Lord has done. Okay. And so, so specifically, now this is to this is in a, a perfect tense. And so here. This is the Lord speaking to Israel. So what we could say is this is the Lord. The Lord reminding Israel what he has done for them. So uh, this is this is not simply a, this is what I did. This is you. You yourselves saw what I did for you. The judgment and salvation over Egypt, the sub, your salvation from Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings, and how I brought you to myself. Let's now, before we continue on, let's take a moment and let's look at the, the theology and the identity of the Lord. So we can come back here. Let's go to Exodus 3. This is where the Lord reveals himself to Moses. Moses is in, is with his father-in-law Jethro. They are in the wilderness, and they came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the dwelling place of God. The angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame of fire out of the bush. He looks, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And the and Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. 
Then the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, to see God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And so just several things that we want to highlight here, the significances of what's being said here. So who is the Lord? The Lord's identity. Number one, his self. He is, he is one who is self-existent, self-sustaining, and this is in the context of what's being revealed in the burning bush. And then number two, which is incredibly important, is that he, he is the God of his father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the Lord is... God, the Lord is the God of his father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what's going on here is this, what's implied here is the Abrahamic covenant. And, and a present relationship. Because by virtue of the covenant. And so what we have here is covenant is in view. A current existent covenant. And so coming over to here. God saves them not because of, of Israel's goodness, not because of Israel's, Israel's faithfulness or because of their ethnicity uh, in the sense that, that, is, that that's a value in an, in an end and of itself. It's because of God's covenant with Abraham. There's nothing intrinsic or special about Israel as it, as it pertains to their nature, as it pertains to who they are. L let's look at, at several other references here. So we can look at chapter 4. So let's look at one, one, one passage that's incredibly significant here. So we can look at Exodus 6, 2 and following. God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of the burdens of Egypt, and I will deliver you from slavery, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Oh, my goodness, great acts of judgment. Coming back to this idea of the, the, the works of God, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So there's so much so much information here. So let's try to add to this here. So we have the Lord is the God of the covenant. He is, he is number four, God almighty, or we could say all powerful. Number, number five, he is the Lord. And this, this is his, his name is, is Yahweh. And so the translation, though debated, I am. And so this picks up on the, the self-existence, self-sustaining. And of course, if you're self-existent and self-sustaining, you have to be all-powerful. And so um, what uh, I do like frames, uh, trifold type description of what the Lord, the, the name signifies, that, that of ultimate authority ultimate power and ultimate presence and th and there's much more especially with the the the, fun the fundamental being the the self-existence 
of of God. And then, of course, this God is also the God of this is also the God of the creator God. Incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, coming back up here, we see that what's I have remembered my covenant with Abraham. I have remembered my covenant. I have established my covenant with them to give the land. And these people, these people are the offspring of, of Abraham. So, so the Mosaic covenant, I'm probably overstepping my bounds because we're going to come back and talk about this in another video on the covenants, but the Abrahamic covenant, which God made with Abraham, is the basis for his salvation. And so fundamentally, when, so, so the big takeaway, the big takeaway I'm trying to, to get to is all of this, we can say a lot of different things, but for our purposes, when we see the name, the Lord, we need to identify fundamentally the covenant. He is the covenantal God. And there is significance here in specifically my, I am their God. I am your God. You are my people. So then this is the covenantal God deals fundamentally in relationship with mankind. So we've, we've looked at the, who Israel is. So, so just to, to kind of come back here to highlight several things here, the Lord is the Lord is, just to summarize, the covenantal God, and the you is God's covenantal people, Israel. And so then this comes down into the question of looking at all that we've seen, that Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the people of Israel are, are in relationship are in relationship with God. So let's let's pull this out. This then implies relationship. And so the question we ask is this only a temporal physical relationship? Or is it spiritual and eternal? And this is one of the questions that gets to what how we should treat the mosaic covenant and so people will want to only see there being a temporal physical component and what we want to say is there's there's a there's a mixing of the two there's both temporal temporal and contextual issues and there's also spiritual and eternal issues and so fundamentally though fundamentally the the relationship is one of spiritual real and eternal Okay, now now if they don't exercise true saving faith, then they're then they don't have that eternal relationship. Okay, but I'm referring to those that did, those that truly believe and trusted in the Lord God of the covenant, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Isaac for sure, and there was others, Joshua, Caleb. Were they only in a physical temporal relationship in the Mosaic covenant, or was that or were there aspects of eternality of of true genuine salvation they're in the presence of the lord and we want to say there's both and so a lot of people will see both but we want but but um some people will deny that they'll say it's purely a temporal relationship and we want to deny that there's 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 temporal and physical aspects for sure but there's also the, the relationship is fundamentally spiritual and eternal it's so what i'm when i'm saying spiritual i'm saying it's real it's it's it, it's a real relationship how can we say this here? Your God, my people. <laughs> Verse one is so much information. Now you have to try to work through this to actually preach it. So you just can't, you know, I'm giving you all the different significances. You have to work this out into a sermon, but you can at least see all the significances, the significance of salvation, the significance of judgment, the, the significance of eyewitness testimony to the works of the works of God.